so uh, this book just came out a few days ago, right. and you said this is, you've talked about it three or four times, uh, and this story is typical of a lot of the work you do in which you t tell this complicated, sweeping, intellectual and environmental and scientific story through personal narratives. You chose these two personalities, this wizard and this prophet, to typify. Well, they sort of chose me, I should say. Yeah. Um, so I want to get to those in a second, uh, the, the two sort of main characters of this book that you, you use to tell the story of the 20th century's environmental movement. But I wanted to start with the sort of opening dilemma um, which is, I think, best explained w through the work of the uh, microbiologist Gauss. Is that how you pronounce his name? Gauza. So Gauza was a microbiologist working with petri dishes right. in the early 20th century, and he discovered that something happened when there was a limited number, uh, limited amount of resources on a petri dish, and he put some microbes on there. W what did he find? Well, he was a great microbiologist, and he conducted some of the first field experiments, and he wrote this classic book um, called The Struggle for Survival. And um, he's actually a very sympathetic character. He was uh, Russian, and um, he was trying to get money for funding. I mean, this is the perpetual um, problem of any graduate student. And so he thought he would do these experiments to get funding. And um, so he wrote this complete classic, uh, The Struggle for Survival, and it wasn't enough to get him funding. Um, <laughs> so what he did in this failed classic was to get these petri dishes and put microorganisms in them, um, protozoa typically, and he filled it full of nutrient goo and then watched what happened. And um, they would multiply and multiply and multiply. Um, they would eat and eat and eat, because from the point of view of a protozoa, a petri dish full of goo is you know, a world of breakfast and um, they would just expand out, then they would hit the edge of the petri dish, and then they would either drown in their own wastes or exhaust the resources, and very bad things would happen to the population. So that there, so that there was this idea that he had, then he was able to demonstrate that there are limits um, in these systems, and the limits are fixed. And this was taken up, as I'm sure that you are about to talk about, by my neighbor, another microbiologist who greatly admired him, Lynn Margulis. Yeah. And Lynn Margulis is, plays a role in this book as a sort of side character who comes in and always whispers in your ear. And her... Yeah, it's kind of yeah. hooting and laughing at me, yeah. pretty much. She's like a, a Greek chorus who says, you are an idiot. And w <laughs> why does she think you're an idiot? Well, actually, uh, in kindness, uh, Lynn d um, died a couple of years yeah. ago. So I'm... Um, but she was, she was this very tough um, woman. She was a very prominent um, biologist. She, won basically every award you could imagine, you know, um, Presidential Medal of Science, National Academies of Sciences, the Crawford Prize. And uh, she thought that people like me uh, were nice, sort of sentimental saps. And um, so she used to come up to me and say, oh, are you all worried about endangered species? And, um, you know, oh, oh, those polar bears. And the reason was um, she knew as a microbiologist that 99% of the world's biomass is microorganisms, you know, bacteria and protists and algae and fungi and, and, and so forth. And that mammals, from this point of view, are just an epiphenomenon. You know, cute, right? But not actually important. And um, so, you know, she would, I was, she would always catch me, and I'd be reading a book about, you know, panda bears or something. She'd, oh, oh, it's so nice, you know, that you care about <laughs> the, 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 those things. But then, you know, that was her, her, her point of view is, look, um, when it came to people, we're not that important. We're just another mammal. Um, you know, one of these tiny dots. We're ruled by the same laws of biology as everything else, including her beloved microorganisms. We're not as interesting as them, but, you know, they, they I mean they can do so much more than us, yeah. you know. Uh, and um, so then she would say, look, here's the rules. And the rules are that everything's the same, right? Um, this is Darwin's great insight. Um, all the rules apply to everybody, everything. And uh, one of the rules are that when species hit an area where they're unconstrained by natural selection, like those protozoa in the Petri dish, they just expand and expand till they hit the edge of the Petri dish, and then bad things happen. And that was what, you know, was going to happen to us. And people like me should stop whining about it. Because <laughs> that's the natural thing. And so for her, the idea that there would be people interested in conservation, if people could actually do this, this would be profoundly weird and unnatural. Right, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I was really struck by that as sort of an opening dilemma because, and you, you do this so well in your work, you, you highlight the scientific story and how it really felt to the discoverers <laughs> of these phenomena and how disturbing it was in the early 20th century as biology is really coming into its own as a discipline to kind of realize this. It's, yeah. Right, and then to apply it to, to um, people. And Lynn was quite 
calm about this, actually, yeah. um, and sort of enjoyed poking me and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and saying, but, you know, then I thought, well, you have to take this seriously. What if she's right? You know, what, what if she's right? And, uh, you know, are all our efforts just foolish, and are we trying to, you know, sort of, as she would put it, beat Darwin? You right. know, good luck with that, right? <laughs> Well, and so th this is the opening dilemma, and right. so the question is, how do we beat Darwin? Right. And you, how do we break the rules? And we're going to break the, if we break the rules, it's yeah, going to be would, like she, magic. Wait, wait yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah, if we break the rules, she would say, oh, you think people are special. <laughs> yeah, you know, and she sort of thought people were special, like, in, oh, they're special, but, you know, you know right. right, in the same real sense, it's special. And uh, so how, are, you know, and that was really how I got started by thinking, like, when I would talk to people, you know, how are we going to break the rules? And I realized um, that there are two ways, that, two kinds of answers that I were getting, each of which is associated, much to my unhappiness, with two dead white guys. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, like, just great, you know, here's another guy writing about two dead white guys. Well, what can I do? That's what they said. Um, yes, and so these white guys are the prophet and the wizard. Right, right. And worse, nobody's ever heard of them. Yeah. So, I would, so I went to my editor and I said, I would really like to uh, write a book about two dead guys nobody's ever heard of. Right. What did your editor say? Great. <laughs> he kind of looked at me like Lynn did. I think, I mean, the fact that they are dead white guys is actually significant to the mm. broader kind of political and cultural reception of mm. this. Because really this is the story of the birth of environmentalism and the right. environmental movement. I, I've heard intellectual historians say that environmentalism is the only successful ideology of the 20th century. And it's, which, when you think about it, what else is there? Right. You know, that's really lasted and is powerful. And an ideology, you know, is this intellectual construct by which people guide their lives and, you know, find meaning and so forth. And environmentalism clearly is that. That's not a diss. Right. You know, that's not a... a but what else came from the 20th century that is still right. has any potency? And not communism. Exactly, yeah. And uh, maybe not capitalism either. <laughs> but, uh, capitalism is a little older, but yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, but for those of us kind of who grew up in the Pacific Northwest, like both of us did, um, the environmentalism feels like a foundational cultural piece. Right. It is to me, yeah. yeah. No, I, I should say immediately I'm a subscriber to this ideology. And so it was interesting to me to find out where my ideas came from. But it's even prior to the 20th century, there wasn't the environment. The right. environment doesn't exist. There are environments, mm -hmm. there are forests. and Yeah, and one of these guys, in, in fact, animal. invented the idea yeah. of the environment. And if you look at you know, 19th century, 18th century um, books, they'll talk about you know, meadows and forests, and those are environments. And um, you know, the Mediterranean is an environment. And they are areas that act on people. And so you'll see geographic textbooks, and they'll say that people who live in you know, Nordic countries are strong and uh, intelligent, and people who live in the you know, warm um, forests of the, you know, of the Amazon, they're, they're torpid, right. and, and, and this sort of, so there's this sort of weird racism that yeah. slides in. And the idea is the environment is a specific thing that acts on people. And what vote um, and the people around yeah. him Enter stage left, our first character. Right, vote. right, <laughs> is turn it around. And he says, no, the environment is something that people act on, right? And, it's, and furthermore, you can talk about it as a global thing, the environment. He doesn't save the environment, right? right? And this is really important because until you name something, you can't really think about it, yeah. right? And so he gives you this, this, this idea, and this is really quite a change. Um, and it, he writes about it in this book called um, The Road to Survival, which was published in 1948, and is the first modern we're all going to hell book. And... Um, <laughs> And if you read, a noble, a noble genre, right? Yeah. A noble genre. But you know, if you read *Silent Spring* by uh, Rachel Carson, or um, you know, uh, the books by Barry Commoner, or *The uh, Population Bomb*, or um, you know, *The Limits to Growth*, or Al Gore's book, um, the, the the first one, yeah. um, there are all the ideas in there. Every one of them stem from vote. Yeah. Well, so I wanted, so to give the audience, who I think most folks in this room have not looked at this book yet, an example of the way you approach this story. We meet Vote in one of my favorite Charles Mannion locations, which are, are these um, guano islands. Yeah, the worst place the I've ever been, Chile. yeah. Um, so for, for folks unfamiliar as I was until I read about <laughs> them in your books, what are these guano islands? Well, they're off the coast of, um, of Peru, mostly. Yeah. Um, and they're the, the, there's these two big, you know, plates, geological plates um, that are on the west coast of um, South America, and they, they intersect, and there's this huge trench that's right off the shore, and in this trench um, is the, what's called the Humboldt Current, which is this uh, quite cold current, and through laws of physics, which I can give you 
details of underwater. It pulls these nutrients up from, you know, the nutrients come from the shore and it gets pulled up um, in this current and there's lots and lots of fish that eat the nutrients and lots and lots of birds that eat the fish and um, they live on these islands. There's 39 of them and they have lived there for really, really long times. And they're big birds um, and particularly something called the guanay cormorant um, which uh, I read this book uh, called The Biogeography of Vertebrate Excretion um, which <laughs> I would not recommend to anyone. And um, there is a single extremely long chapter about these guanay cormorants and their excretion habits. And it turns out that this guy measured them and um, the, the, the excretion. And um, they excrete on average, he sampled several hundred birds, 35 pounds a year, um, which is just a lot. And um, in, as a lay person, I was trying to, yeah. yeah. And um, there are thousands and zillions, and there are actually millions of these things. And so they produce these huge hills of guano, bird excrement, hundreds of feet high. And it turns out to be great fertilizer. And so in the 1860s, this was discovered and it became the world's first high intensity fertilizer and became super important to the uh, government of was Peru. It was a very critical global resource. Right, commodity. right. Yeah. There's a giant fertilizer rush. And so, um, and uh, as is typical in these things, boomtown behavior is never very good, never really good to look at. They wanted, it's awful. Can you imagine being a guano miner? Right. I mean, you know, just terrible and so they bring in slaves from China, they literally are um, slaves and uh, they set up this huge global um, industry, it's very important to um, Peru and vote comes in because the birds start to die off, right. which are the, the source and they need to bring in um, you know, an expert and um, none of the American bird experts want to go down there, Right. you know it's okay to, I, I visited them, I could see why they did not want to, um, it's like 100% bus stop bathroom everywhere. Um, and uh, they, they, there is this guy they knew who is a semi-professional, you know, a, an obsessive bird watcher, and they said, send him, and this was William Vogt, yeah. a French literature major. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he would go on immediately after this to do some spying yeah. for the State Department in the Second World War, trying to find, uh, Nazis. Uh, and find Nazis in South American governments right. with his wife, and so this incredible human story culminates in this book that is the sort of origin right. of the movement. And he discovers, movement. and yeah. so just to make sure that, I, I, this sounds crazy, I know, <laughs> this whole thing, but it's actually true, um, and what he discovers, um, he's one of the people who discovers the, 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 what's called ENSO now, the El Nino-La Nina oscillation, which there right. is these um, shifts in ocean currents, and what happens when you have El Nino is that the water gets warm, and the anchovetas, which are the main fish there the, the, that the uh, guanay cormorants eat, don't like the warm water, and they move far out shore, and it's too far for the cormorants to reach them, and they start to die. And so he realized that you cannot raise the population. He was brought there um, to raise the bird population to, as he said, augment the increment of excrement. And, um, <laughs> and, he, um, and he says, whoa, you know, there's this oscillation happening. We can't do it because if we raise the bird population, when the next El Nino happens, it's just going to crash. And so nature sets these limits. It's, um, and he called it carrying capacity, which mm -hmm. is a uh, word that his best friend, Aldo Leopold, the famous conservationist, yeah. had um, sort of brought into to, um, mainstream ecological discourse. And he said, this is a model for everything. This is a model for the world, that there's a carrying capacity that the world has, and we're in danger of exceeding it. Yeah. And so you name this way of thinking prophetic, or the, 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 the thinking of a prophet, and I think I, I will briefly read a couple sentences from your book um, as you're sort of laying out the central tenet that Vogt is arriving at at this mm -hmm. period in his life leading up to the writing of that book. Uh, laid out the prophet's central tenet. Humankind, though apt to forget it, is a creature of the earth. Dust thou art, and all flesh is grass. We're not said by scientists, but they are sound biology. This is Vogt, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Unless humankind controlled its appetites for procreation and consumption, Vogt said, there can be no peace. And so the conclusion, the prophetic conclusion, is that given these constraints, given this mm -hmm. carrying capacity, how, how can we beat the fate of the microbes on the Petri dish? How do we come, how do we, how do we defy your friend's uh, Limbs, prediction? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, she said essentially, you look and you say, these systems are limited, yeah. and you fit yourself within them. Yeah. And uh, you, 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 
see that the birds are happy as long as they stay within the limits uh, provided by El, El Nino. And because we are conscious creatures, we can see what those limits are yeah. and adjust our society um, accordingly. And this is, you know, when you think about it, this is the basic idea of, en of environmentalism is to recognize the natural limits. They're, they've been called a bunch of things, carrying capacity, ecological limits, planetary boundaries, you know, um, you know, you'll talk about there's sort of an Earth one and how we're using more than one Earth's share of resources and all. It's all the same right. thing. Um, and, it, you know, it's encapsulated and brought to the public for the first time by, by, by him. Yeah. Something that I found challenging and really useful to read in, in this story is, I think, in the end, my sympathies really fall with Vote okay. in this conflict. But a lot of the... I mean, a lot of the 20th century environmental movement actually emerged from the right, from mm -hmm. uh, sort of right-wing conservationists, mm -hmm. aristocrats, and then white supremacists who sort of were uh, concerned about the overpopulation of what they well, perceived as the unwashed masses. Right, right. They were concerned about that there are too many dark-skinned people. Right. And, uh, and that, that's deeply troubling, but ultimately this, this ideology through the 60s and through Rachel Carson is developed into the science of ecology. Right. Uh, and Vogt is really this, this sort of great advocate of the scientific perspective of ecology. Right. And I think it's worth remembering that ecology is both a science and a political movement and a sort of cultural perspective on the environment that are all well, I think you might, for it might be better to say that ecology yeah. is a science, yeah. you know, and then there, it, but it's entwined with a, but, but not the same as yeah. uh, the movement of environmentalism. You know, because in, at least in theory, you could say, oh, okay, there are these natural cycles, who cares, let's go on ahead, right? right. Um, and so there's the scientific findings, and what Vogt said is these can be applied to the human condition, right. and something that had been, you know, kind of a, something that was uh, restricted to a few laboratory scientists, because the original conservationists weren't really scientists so much. They were people who said, oh, it's so sad. Um, they were like me. They said, oh, it's sad there aren't any bison. You know, Lynn Margulis would have been laughing at them. Um, and it was all entwined also with this idea that, um, you know, you have these pure environments and you need to have this pure race. And right. Pure, right, right. And, and, and I think there's both sort of po po political problems with that, and it turns out there are scientific profound scientific flaws yeah. with the sort of naive ecological idea that there is this um, homeostatic system that is disturbed by human intervention and that what needs to happen is that we return it to nature. Right. Because every system in the world has been profoundly influenced by human behavior prior to the 20th century. And humans are part and parcel of those. Yeah, systems. and they're not so much um, homeostatic as they are dynamic. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're, and they're constantly shifting around and, and, and changing. Um, but they can change again within limits because it's right. quite clear the Earth is finite that there are limits. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, there's some who want to push against that idea of limits, at least to a point, and that enter stage right is our second ideological perspective, our second main character, Norman Borlaug. So, do you want to say a little bit about sure? His he background? was the other guy yeah. um, whose name kept coming up yeah. uh, when I was uh, when I was talking to researchers about this, and he is. Um, in his life, he was raised very poor. Both of them came from very poor um, uh, families he was in Iowa. Um, he wanted to escape the farm, which was this horrible uh, grinding labor. And by playing baseball for the, um, for the Chicago Cubs, um, he didn't get to do it, but he went to college. He was the first right. member of his family to go to college. And um, Henry Ford's tractor yeah, made him feel less guilty about, about leaving yeah. his family, because his family was able to buy this little tractor. Um, <laughs> And he uh, majored in forestry, really because he liked going outdoors. That was the only uh, reason. And then he graduated at the height of the Depression and um, couldn't get a job. So he stuck around like many people did in, say, 2008, um, who graduated and became, got a gra graduate degree. And it happened that he got a graduate degree in the University of Minnesota with this guy named Elvin Stakeman, who was a major uh, American uh, 20th century scientist who was involved in this project in Mexico. And um, he picked Borlaug and said, you're going to be my guy in Mexico. And this was Project Mexico was from the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mexico was desperately poor then. Uh, you know, about two-thirds of the country at one point or another during the year would not have enough to eat. Um, so malnutrition was completely rampant. And uh, there are problems where the main food was corn, you know, to make, um, as you know, from in Mexico. And maize yields were actually going down. And so even though um, the, the amount of the country that was being planted in maize corn was constantly expanding, 
the total harvest was actually going down. Yeah. And so Mexico's uh, corn yield, uh, corn harvest went down by about a third between 1920 and 1940. And the situation was absolutely desperate and, the and they asked the Rockefeller Foundation to come in. The Rockefeller Foundation was afraid of being seen as these gringo invaders. Um, they sent a very poorly equipped team of scientists. And Borlaug was on this weird little side project to look at wheat because there were a few Mexican wheat farmers and they were absolutely afflicted by this fungus called stem rust. And so his job was to try to breed rust resistant wheat. Um, and this was a completely stupid idea. Um, Borlaug didn't speak Spanish. He'd never been out of the country. He'd never researched wheat. He'd never um, um, done any plant breeding what's, whatsoever. And he was all trying to do this before anybody knew what a gene was, because Watson and Crick weren't for another 10 years. Um, and he didn't know, as somebody like Lynn would tell you, that wheat is much more interesting than people. And one of the reasons that wheat is much more interesting than people um, is it has five times more genes. Um, and that's because it, wheat can do, like a lot of plants, things that people can't because we're so boring. Um, and that is that it can have multiple genomes. In, so every wheat cell has three complete genomes, which means there are six copies of each gene there, basically. And so breeding it is a nightmare. Yeah. And um, Borlaug knew none of this. But nonetheless, by just sheer, also he had no laboratory equipment, he had no fields. It was just a disaster. And um, he then, you know, working with two guys, went all through Mexico collecting these samples of wheat, trying to look for resistant wheat. He planted 8,600 of them all by hand, checking them all, you know, in the hot sun um, at, of 7,000 feet in central Mexico. And of those 8,600, all but four died. Um, <laughs> and uh, those four were riddled with, they didn't die, but they weren't very good. And so he said, okay, this is not gonna work. What I'm gonna do is try to throw a whole lot of darts at bullseyes. And so I'm gonna take every, type of wheat that I can find anywhere in the world, and I'm going to breed them all to each other. You know, tens of thousands of crosses, and, um, which is a nightmare of um, data storage, if you yeah. can imagine. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go in the fields, and I'm going to snip off the pollen-bearing parts, the male parts of the plant, you know, with my little tweezers, and I can put a little bag over them, wait for them to mature, and then I'm going to take the female parts, or, um, excuse me, the male parts, and sprinkle them on individually, count every grain seed, you know, measure everything, and lo and behold, this is sort of unbelievable superhuman labor. He uh, created a type of rust-resistant wheat, um, and then he went beyond that to create stuff that could basically be grown anywhere and would have enormously uh, greater harvests. And the reason that this was all important was twofold. First, on the practical level, um, these increased grain harvests around the world because uh, it was quickly duplicated with rice and then um, to a lesser extent corn. And back in the 50s and 60s, it was commonly believed that there were massive famines um, in the world in the 70s and 80s. And those just simply didn't happen. Yeah. And um, there were some famines, but nowhere close to what, w what was thought. And, you know, in 1970, when I went to high school, um, something like a third of the world was malnourished. And now it's about 8 9%. Yeah. And, and the world's population has doubled in the interim. So you, you know, do the arithmetic. It's an extraordinary event. And this became the sort of emblem of the idea that science and technology, you, you apply them properly, and you can produce your way out of these things. And right. you can say, you know, the heck with the limits. We just got to be smart. And, I mean, Borlaug is a great character because he is so typifies that sort of can-do American, mm -hmm. washucks optimism, yeah. and, you know, who... and. I think anyone would be sympathetic towards t science and industrial uh, capitalism and agriculture when the Henry Ford tractor freed them from their family right. farm on Iowa and they get to be in this incredible transformation of, of how we think about plants. And he was and very, very genuine. He was a, yeah. you know, an extraordinarily decent guy. He saw really poor people in really bad shape and thought, maybe I can help them. And uh, there's a there's a quote, especially if there's, if there's some. I think I hope there's some students in the room, maybe some science students, uh, when you're t talking about that early part of his career when he was doing that Herculean effort of crossbreeding. Uh, I believe this is your your language. Uh, prerequisite for a successful scientific career is an enthusiastic willingness to pour through a minutia of subjects that 99.9 percent .9 of Earth's population find exceedingly dull or screamingly dull. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, and Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> and it's true. Um, it's true. My, my uh, father-in-law is a physicist, and his uh, willingness to um, look through enormously long calculations um, is awe-inspiring. Yeah. yeah. And so this transformation of world agriculture 
is what was known as the Green Revolution. Right. He won a Nobel Prize um, for his contributions there. But there was a pretty significant and almost immediate political and cultural backlash to some of the sort of the, the political consequences of the Green Revolution. And the environmental consequences, yeah. yeah. And, um, okay, so the Green Revolution is actually both the seeds that he developed and, in a sense, what he did was develop types of wheat that are not only disease resistant and can be planted anywhere, but can respond very well to fertilizer. You fertilize them and they grow like mad. Yeah. Industrial chemical yeah. fertilizers, right. I mean, they'll do fine with guano, but you're yeah. really talking about setting the factories going. Yeah. And um, they also really need irrigation. And so you have this package, it was called, and you bring in this, you bring it almost anywhere, and boom, the amount of uh, food grows up. You know, the amount of uh, harvest goes up just threefold, fourfold, some places like Pakistan, tenfold. It's amazing. But um, about 40% of the fertilizer, typically, that gets um, put on doesn't go there. Um, gets whooshed away. A bunch of it goes into the air and as in the form of nitric oxides, and they interact with the ozone layer um, if they go high enough. Um, they cause all kinds of pollution if they stay you know, close to the surface. A whole lot of it goes into the streams, it goes into the oceans. Uh, fertilizer in the ocean is still fertilizer. It causes all the algae to grow like mad. Um, a whole bunch of you know, plants, microorganisms to grow like mad. They die eventually. Um, they fall to the ocean floor. Microorganisms consume them, and when they do, they grow so rapidly on this huge rain of manna yeah. that they um, consume all the ocean. They consume all the oxygen in the ocean, and so um, you know, off, off where the, uh, the Mississippi pours in, we have a dead spot where there's no oxygen um, in the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 7,000 square miles, and in, uh, about a year ago, um, they, me they measured scientists measured the one in the Bay of Bengal. It's three times larger, 21,000 square miles, where there basically nothing can live, and that is the you know, yeah. the downside of the Green Revolution. If it wasn't for climate change, nitrogen pr um, pollution would probably be our worst environmental problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then the irrigation, if it's done, not done properly, the water evaporates, leaves salts behind, and poisons the soil, and there's large areas that have been salinized. Um, so that, you know, there's severe economic, uh, environmental downsides. And the economic ones and the social ones are also equally severe, because Borlaug was just a straight ahead scientist, never thought about the fact that if you have these poor farmers um, in areas where laws aren't you know, particularly well obeyed and property rights aren't well established, suddenly their land is much more valuable because they can grow much more on it and it's now worth stealing. And that's just what happened. Yeah. Um, and this was, um, huge numbers of people were pushed off the land and this was actually encouraged by governments because they said, great, get these people off the land and now we can pile them in the cities and use them for factories for, for um, industrialization. And so these vast slums, um, in the, particularly in the global south, of displaced farm families uh, were created and that's where you get the modern megacity. And you, uh, you interviewed Borlaug at the end of his life. Yes, I did. Yeah, and Not for this book because I didn't know I was writing yeah. the book because he died in 2009. It was like one of the great in retrospect, one of the great wasted opportunities in my career. <laughs> well, I, I think you did a nice, nice yes. job, okay. as recounted in the book. And I mean, it, and he had a kind of sunny optimism even at the end. Uh, and mm -hmm. s there was a Wall Street Journal profile near the end of his life that estimated the number of lives that this technique had saved. Was a billion, yeah. A you billion know. lives. Yeah, yeah. now I, sh I should say that number is completely bogus. They yeah. just made it up. But still, it was a lot. And. Um, <laughs> Well, what, I think you said to him, even if that was off by right, order right, no, of magnitude. So, so I was talking, and then, then I did this stupid sports journalist question. You know, we yeah. talked, and, and I said, you know, this headline just came out. It said you saved a billion lives. You know, and then I did the sports thing, which is, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and um, really a stupid question, but I, I sort of want to know. And um, he did what any normal person would do, which is to say, oh, that's an exaggeration, and there's many more people than me, and, you know, sort of deflected. And I said, okay, look. Suppose they're off by an order of magnitude, and you only saved 100 million lives. How do, you know, what about that? And there's a long pause, and he says, you know what? It felt pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's our other central character that we right. follow through the book in this, in this uh, what turns into this beautiful illustration of the conflict at the heart of a lot of environmental uh, concerns, the prophets and the wizards. Uh, I should say wizard. why I picked that, because Votian, right? Doesn't that sound like a Star Trek guy? Yeah. You know, <laughs> Kipton, Kipton, the Votian ambassador. Borlogian, no, no. So pro I think pro Wizard and Prophet is better. Yeah. Well, I like... Please don't tell me I'm wrong, because I'm, like, committed. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, you use a couple words to sort of refine... Um, what the wizard worldview is, 
you would you might describe it as techno optimism. Right. I mean, on tech, I, I actually described all this to a friend of mine who's a philosopher, and um, so I said, you know, what would you call them? And, and he said, well, you know, so the wizards are um, probably Schumpeterian technophiliac meliorists. <laughs> 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 and I just thought, okay. <laughs> and the um, I forget what the the, the um, one for the the prophets was uh, neo Burkean processualist, and then there was a. German term that I had never heard ah. of and that he assured me was an actual philosophical word. No. It means it's sort of a watchful hovering over, and that's what you do with nature is a watchful, a watchful attentiveness. I, I suspect philosophers sometimes invent German words, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, but the other um, term that I really liked is cornucopianism, right. and it's this view that the world is a bounty and it's human ingenuity's responsibility to access that. Right, bounty. the world is a toolbox. Right. And, um, and we have the ability, you know, with our, um, to mix it up and yeah. to create what we need uh, out of it. It's like a blank canvas that we can paint on. Yeah, well, I, the, the apologies, but the extremely academic side of me wanted to bring up the um, essay by Martin Heidegger from right. the 1950s, the um, question concerning technology at the end of his life which is a very much a, a classic prophetic yeah. view against intervention against in nature. Against just that. Yeah. And the fancy German word there is bestand, which is the standing reserve. That, that you notice that he said it. I did not <laughs> use that. That word is not in my book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that that philosopher was deeply critical of, this technological idea that the world out there is this reserve for us right, to go right. in and make of it what we will. Right, and, and then the prophet's idea is that you know, what is there came through a process and it embodies you know, systems that have integrity and a value in and of themselves. Right. And you shouldn't just mess with them. Well, I think the other way to say it is that the prophets view the environment as the protagonist. Right. And the, the wizards view us as the protagonist. Right, so there's an argument about what is figure and what is ground. Yeah. Um, and this so is awfully fancy. <laughs> well, we're in, we're in a university. So okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Uh, so then um, the book follows uh, the four elements, yeah. really beautifully uh, constructed. It's, it's, it's Earth, cheesy, water, kinda, fire, I know. and air. Um, the, and uh, I don't know if you ever were of different generations, but if you know Captain Planet, yeah. the, the cartoon that had a very prophetic uh, kind of Rachel Carson right. vibe to it, where it was Earth, air, fire, water, and then the final element know was that. heart oh, right. uh, that, that united. All no, I didn't know elements. that. Actually, I stole this from Michael Pollan. Um, He's a friend, and he had a book that was Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. And he told me about it when he was writing, and I'm pretty sure it lodged my memory. And so I, and so, um, I wrote, so was writing mine, and then his came out. And I thought, oh, God, I stole this from him. So I wrote to him, and I said, look, I have the same sort of organization scheme that you, you have in your book, Cooked. And he said, oh, no, it's okay. I stole it from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so each of these elements um, guides us on a conversation about a, sort of the present concerns about the the still in the background real concern of population, right? Right. So this ancient Malthusian problem that sort of keeps kind of coming true but kind of being subverted that was then also in mm -hmm. uh, the population bomb famously still sort of is in the background yeah. and th it led to the inspiration of why you wrote this book, uh, which you shared a little bit earlier but maybe would be worth sharing again. So what drove you into writing this book? Well, so I guess a little bit was uh, what, uh, one thing that drove me is my own personal contribution to the population bomb, which is the birth of my daughter. Um, and uh, as I, I mentioned, I was talking to you earlier, um, if any of you have had children, um, you know that there's an entire industry devoted to making you think as a father that you have something to do with the birth and that you are playing a role in it. And, um, and so they, they have you go to classes and, and so forth. I did all that and, um, and you know, they kept telling me during the birth, oh, it's so important that you're here and counting and breathing and, and so forth. And then um, you know, as soon as it was over, they said, out of there, guy. And um, because the people had actually done something, you know, needed to go to, to rest and so I'm standing there in the hospital parking lot, because it's always three o'clock in the morning and it's February in New England and I'm sort of going, whoa, you know, what happened? And um, suddenly this thought pops into my head, which is that in, when my daughter, Amelia, uh, is my age, that there's gonna be about 10 billion people in the world. And um, I had known this, I mean, I think most people sort of have some idea, but it really hit me, I don't know. I guess I had more skin in the game now. Right. And, um, I, uh, and I thought, also, that a lot of those people are going to be affluent. And so, how is that going to work? 
And so I'm a science journalist, as you mentioned in the beginning, and I would be talking to scientists, and if they were concerned about this, if they're biologists or you know, environmental scientists, I would say, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna provide, how, how is everybody gonna get fed? How's everybody, how are we gonna have water, energy? You know, what are we gonna do about climate change? And um, that's when these two names kept coming right. up. Right. And so these are the two in each of these areas. So earth is agriculture, it's right. food. It's, we've been talking a lot about the green revolution when right. it grew into that. But how are we gonna feed these 10 billion people? Right. And notably, how are we gonna feed them at this middle class American meat gorge well, if that's <laughs> diet? Gonna, yeah. If that's what we're gonna do. Yeah. Um, and the wizards and the prophet have different paths. Right. There's uh, water, which is drinking water, water right. potable water, but... Right. Um, Fresh water, yeah. yeah. And the... Actually, that was a big shock yeah. for me. I did not realize how little fresh water there, there was. And there's an illustration in the book that when I saw it, I might, you know, my jaw hit the floor. Because, um, you know, you think, you look at the, the map of the, you know, the, the world and it, there's all this water. But it's actually just a little thin skim, yeah. you know, on it. Most of it's rock, right? And um, the entire Earth's supply of water of every sort can be bundled up into a ball about 870 miles in diameter. Um, and 97% of that's salt water, which you can't drink. It's toxic, and um, even that 3%, the vast bulk of that is either locked up in glaciers or deep underground or contaminated. So the entire world supply of fresh water is a ball about 35 miles in diameter. Yeah. And um, we're exponentially increasing the amount of, and so I looked at it and I said, holy cow. Yeah, Town Hall hosts occasionally politicians and sort of national security and foreign policy conversations. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, the question of water is treated really seriously in those circles. Right. Like the U.S. So Navy is very concerned right. about the world's supply of fresh water. So here's a very weird fact um, that also is not, everything, you know, this is one of those things where I'm reading, and everything I thought I knew was wrong, and everything that I thought was easy was hard, and everything I thought was hard is easy, and, and, and so forth. And so one of the things I'm doing is, I thought, oh my God, look at that, there's gonna be water wars. And then it turns out that people have studied it, and water wars are incredibly uncommon. The only known water war in the last 4,500 years was like in Babylonia, ancient <laughs> Babylonia. And since then, amazingly, people have always found some way to avoid it. Now, Past success doesn't guarantee future success, but you hear this and you think, God, could we really be such losers as to have the first water war in 4,500 right. years occur in our watch? Well, you notice that water, societies treat water with a special sacredness, right. pretty universally, and that there's something about clean water that screams out as a public good. You know, this discussion is really making me thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, that, is something that I think pe folks in the Pacific Northwest with our beautiful <laughs> water system yeah. uh, really cherish, but it, especially looking at California, yeah. the droughts and the agriculture And there's there. a huge yeah. wizard prophet type fight there. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go there, the convulsing state politics is that Jerry Brown has this plan to dramatically increase the state's water supply. That's the wizard's way, let's make more um, in two ways. One, by having major desalination plants ringing the coast, there's 20 plus that are proposed, really big things. Um, and then the second one is to make this huge channel, um, the last sort of major unchanneled, undammed um, rivers, the Sacramento, and they're gonna pump it all you know, through these, um, to join the already existing giant mega water projects that they have to you know, pr provide more water for the south. So depending cost on- about, about you know, a gazillion dollars. That's the, that's the wizard's way. Yeah. And the profits look at this and think, this is completely nuts. Um, the desalination plants are super expensive, and what is it for? Well, go to Palm Springs, you know, there are places like that. They're full of golf courses. Go to the Central Valley, they're growing rice in the desert. You know, one of the crazy things is they're growing alfalfa all through the Central Valley. And where does alfalfa go? It goes to the Middle West to feed um, cattle. They can grow alfalfa in the Middle West, but the water in the Central Valley is so cheap because of its subs subsidies that it's actually, it's crazy, it is crazy. Yeah. And um, so they say, look, Instead of making more, why don't we be smart about what we have and be thrifty? So if folks in the room felt that emotional roller coaster there of oscillating between optimism about n sort of new water technologies mm -hmm. and then disgust at this, <laughs> this incredible waste of water, then you have experienced the emotional roller coaster of this book. This is, this is the story of this vacillation between these two worldviews. Right. Thanks, and, I yeah. think. Yeah. 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 No, uh, <laughs> Um, so we have the Wizards and the Prophets on water, and then fire is energy. Yeah, and energy supply. Yeah, and, and I th 
I think the, how profits think about the energy supply, I think, is close to a lot of our hearts. Right, it's, you know, small scale network solar and wind. And in fact, one of the things, again, that surprised me is that this idea was really articulated in the 1870s. Um, solar power, people have been trying to go, do just exactly this. Um, since then, there's a guy named John Erickson who put it all out in a manifesto that is totally something that you could read today. They didn't have um, photovoltaic panels, but they had this idea, they looked kind of like giant upside down lampshades that had mirrors on them and they would boil steam and drive steam engines. And the idea is that these were gonna be everywhere. Um, and uh, they, then the wizards, of course, were in favor of fossil fuels because they didn't know about climate change. And they said, pointed out that they had superior energy density and so you'd have these huge plants and then they would have the feed, you know, that would go um, out to everybody. And the economics in favor of them were um, so large that even though the profits kept trying and trying and trying with the solar energy, it never caught fire until really climate change comes in and puts its thumb on the scale. Um, and at that point, um, you know, the full scale war breaks out. Yeah. And the wizards say, okay, you're right, and they switch to nuclear power. Because yeah. nuclear power is solar, is, is, is uh, carbon free. And so now you have quite a fight in the policy science between saying, how can you shut down these nuclear power plants? They are our biggest source of carbon free energy. And they're right, they are the biggest source of carbon free energy. You, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's tough. And so in my state, in Massachusetts, um, the uh, Sierra Club is trying to shut down um, the Pilgrim plant, which provides five, roughly 5% 5 of the power for all of New England. And um, you know, the, the, the wizards say, this is completely nuts, um, you know, because where is it going to come from? It, it's, it's, and they say, oh, it's going to come from solar plants, and uh, the solar power would have to increase, I, I think it's by a factor of seven, um, the, the existing solar penetration to make it up um, for what it is, and none of that has adequate storage. And then the final fault line between the wizards and the prophets is air, which is climate change. Right. And our approach to climate change. Climate change, there's a little asterisk on it because it's a different kind of problem in right. a lot of ways. But briefly, uh, Charles does this incredible thing in the book. For any, I think most people in this room are probably not climate skeptics. But uh, if you are in a community with, if you have family members, if you have, get angry arguments around climate skepticism, he brackets that question and says, let's just come along with me, let me talk through this problem of climate change, and I'll return to it at the appendix, and we'll, we'll have you lay that out in, in beautiful detail, maybe uh, at the very end of okay. the conversation. Thank you. But so let's all assume for a moment climate change is real. What are the wizards and prophets? Uh, yeah, no, please do, please, just for a moment, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can argue at the end, okay? Um, and so what the wizards want, of course, is to maximize the, you know, the punch they have, and they say, let's have these huge centralized um, facilities, and it really does sort of boil down to nuclear power. And, and it's not crazy, you know? It may not be what you want, but it's not crazy, because it, it has the lowest footprint, it's actually incredibly safe, more people are actually literally, truly, even despite things like Fukushima, are actually killed by solar power, and that's because all the people who are installing them on roofs fall off. And, um, and it's really true. Actually, it's a, it's a significant problem. Um, people get killed, you know, in installing them. Um, and then uh, they're also extremely reliable once they are on. You know, they, they, a lot of power plants sort of fluctuate, whether they're working in nuclear power plants are very, very reliable. They're incredibly expensive to build. And then there's the, the, the waste problem. But, um, you know, if you add it up, the waste problem actually, you know, isn't that large in a geographic term. And what they also, the, the wizards like, is it leaves more room for nature because the solar power has a, such a footprint. Now, of course, profits think this is crazy because it's way too expensive. Um, and to say that it's cheap once you've made it, you know, that's sort of like saying, um, you know, this super gourmet meal that costs 500 bucks is cheap once you eat it. You know, what about, you know, making it and paying for it is, is really expensive. And they also see the idea that we're just going to deal with the waste somehow later as right. kind of an insult to the future and, you know, an offense, uh, a moral offense. And so they don't like this, and instead they propose this idea of networked um, uh, solar power, which presumes a much more inhabited countryside. And, um, you know, and there's a real fault line there because what the wizards typically want to do is pack everybody into cities right. um, where you have, you know, typically, you know, atomized individuals who can do the most for themselves, you know, and it's a kind of vision of individual empowerment. Right. And uh, the profits typically don't like that. 
um, they typically want to say, no, no, you know, people are supposed to be in, you know, smaller communities where their things operate on human scale and democracy can take place. And those of you who study American history will hear echoes of the fights between Jefferson and Hamilton, um, between Gifford Pinchot and John Muir and, and all that. So th this is, you know, this kind of division has been going on for a long time. I just happened to pick these two guys, or rather yeah. the people I talked to picked these two guys. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that you choose them because these are the, where the kind of science story begins. Right. And w for those of you who have been, had anything on stage tonight piqued your interest, this book is full of incredible profiles of scientists and policymakers working in these, uh, on these questions, grappling in real time with these problems. And I think that that's the real gift of this kind of science journalism is it makes these problems human and real uh, and not merely a data on a screen or a political punching right. bag. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that Thank uh, you. very much. We're well, it is what people, you know, it's something that people, people are involved. I mean, yeah. that's, 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 that's what's, you know, at bottom here is the behavior of people. How do we think about it? And then also, you know, underneath all these fights are ideas about who are we? Right, what is the, what is the life we want to live? Right. And, uh, and that, that the two paths are to deal with our current environmental crises lead us to such dramatically different mm -hmm. forms of life and what the good life looks like, a more communitarian uh, space and a more individualistic space, um, maybe different kinds of economic models. Mm -hmm. um, something that I, I, you, you don't really touch on that much in the book, but I wanted to bring up because I think increasingly it's a really important way to talk about environmental politics is the idea of environmental justice. Mm -hmm. The environmental justice lens, I think really well uh, argued in Naomi Klein's mm -hmm. relatively recent book, uh, uh, This Changes Everything mm -hmm. on Climate Change. And, and, and in the work of particularly um, indigenous, global south activists. I should point out that Naomi Klein's a prophet. Yeah, and, very much so. Yeah, and um, you know, wizards object. To what, what, what she says, and they say, wait a minute, she hates capitalism. Yeah. Right, that's what she, all her previous books. And so what she's using climate change is as an excuse to do what she wants to do anyway, which is get rid of capitalism. Right. And the counter argument, um, the, the point about this is to try and not to say, oh, she's terrible or something like that, but to be aware that there is a counter argument and think, you know, what do you think about it? Right. Is, okay, um, you don't like capitalism. Well, suppose that you want to have coffee in the morning. I think you're in Seattle, right? People have coffee. You, I, I hear you guys are interested in it, right? right? It, 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 you know, I left a little while ago and it wasn't as crazy. Um, where's that coffee going to come from? It's not going to come from here. It's going to come from South America or Africa. Or well, how is it going to happen there? It's going to be collected and carried on ships. And it doesn't really matter whether it's communism or socialism, or whatever. It's very difficult to imagine how that. Um, coffee is going to come here without a kind of mobilization of resources, the assembly of capital, and something that's like capitalism, if not in it, its right. name. And the government won't do it unless it perceives it to be of some value, in other words, profit. And so right. that, you know, the, the, much of the stuff that's going to, that, we're, that we're worried about is going to happen, you know, sort of independent of whether it's corporate capitalism or the state doing it or, or, or what have you. And you can see this in the socialist countries didn't exactly accumulate the world's best environmental record. Absolutely. And I think one of the values of this book is coming to it from what any ideological perspective you will find challenges <laughs> yeah. to your own perspective and sympathetic figures on the opposing perspective. Um, so we're very close to o opening up uh, for Q&A. Uh, the last question I want to give to you is an opportunity to explain climate change. You said you have a three-minute... Okay, uh, we'll so, hope some, so one, of the premises, uh, one of the premises of this book, and I also hope this talk, is yeah. that I wouldn't be lecturing to you, that you know, it would be a fun thing. But now I'm going to lecture to you, <laughs> uh, but very shortly. And the reason is that one of the frustrating things for me uh, about discussing climate change is that you know people who have good-hearted um, on all sides are, are, are talking about this, but they don't really know how it works because they think it's so complicated. And as did I. In fact, I dreaded writing about it because I thought, oh, God, I've, I've looked at these models. They're impossible to understand and, and so forth. And then it wasn't until I sort of um, looked at some of the early textbooks that I realized that the fundamental parts of it are actually not hard to un un understand and that I, every family, I think, has um, some member... Um, you know, an uh, uncle in my case, um, who is, you know, oh, it's all a bunch of hogwash and libtards and th this sort of thing. And I've had some success in talking about it on the level of basic chemistry. 
Um, and so this is the basic chemistry way of understanding climate change. Um, you know, the sun comes down, beams on the earth 24-7, and it provides all kinds of radiation. So there's, you know, the visible light and microwaves and x-rays, and you know, you name it. About a third of it bounces off, you know, reflected by the clouds or dust in the air. So a little bit of it is absorbed by the ozone layer, the ultraviolet. And so most of what comes down and lands on earth is visible light. And, um, but you know, there's the other stuff too. That's why you get sunburn. There's some ultraviolet. It lands on the earth lands on the vegetation, lands in water, and all of them heat up, right? Because the sunlight is shining on them. They don't store up that energy forever because otherwise it would just hotter and hotter and hotter. And what they do is they release it in the form of infrared light. And infrared light is the kind like James Bond, you know, had those gold glasses and he was seeing the heat signatures and so forth. So, it, so all this stuff comes in, infrared light comes out. Now there's a weird fact. Here's, the, here's There's like two facts you're going to have to learn. One is that the atmosphere, 99% of it is oxygen, is oxygen and nitrogen. And a weird fact about oxygen and nitrogen is they don't absorb infrared light. So if the atmosphere is 100% oxygen and nitrogen, all that infrared light would just pass right through it and our Earth would be a snowball. But fortunately, there's like 1% water vapor. And water vapor is kind of like this master switch for the atmosphere. It does absorb infrared light, and then it passes it on to the oxygen and nitrogen. And that's how the atmosphere works. And that's why we have, you know, the warm um, atmosphere that we do. But there's these few wavelengths that um, water vapor sort of goes, nah, I'm not going to absorb you. And they pass through. And that acts as an escape valve. And just enough is let through these few wave of these few wavelengths so that the atmosphere doesn't heat up and become extremely hot. And so there, that's the balanced system. Now, enter a piece of tremendous bad luck. And that is that carbon dioxide blocks just those wavelengths. And so imagine, if you like, that we're all sitting in a bathtub. And infrared light is pouring in, and that's the water, right? And we're all just cozy sitting in this nice warm tub. And there's these little holes around the edge, and the water's pouring out. And that's the wavelengths that are lit through. Now some mischievous person comes and sticks chewing gum in those little holes, what will happen is the water will rise. And that's climate change. That's all there is to it. There is nothing more. And you can, um, there's these complications, you know, having to do with clouds and the st structure of the atmosphere and, and so forth. And that's what the, all those models are trying to see. But the basic physical mechanism is all this. And the reason for going into it is that the way that was understood is, you know, is spectroscopy, which was this technique that was invented in the 1880s of seeing what kinds of light that various elements and various molecules um, absorb. And if climate change is wrong, a lot, it can't be the only part of spectroscopy that's wrong. And that means all of basic chemistry is wrong, probably the periodic table is wrong. You know, so when people are denying, if you like, climate change, they don't know it, but they're attacking huge swath of basic science. And so I said to my um, uncle, I said, look, he should stop with the climate change because what he had found out when he found out that climate change was wrong was that everything else was wrong. And that's so much more important that he should immediately write that up and get the Nobel Prize. And <laughs> so this is why scientists go crazy when, you, when they say that this is a hoax and so forth because if this is wrong, everything else is, is, is wrong. And this basic mechanism is really not hard to understand. Anyway, end of sermon, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is a great spot to open up the Q&A. Thanks so much, Charles Thank Mann. <laughs> when Paul Ehrlich was at Town Hall two, three years ago, uh, he said that he actually, in his famous book, Population Bomb, underestimated the impact of what was gonna be out in the future because he didn't fully understand climate change. And things are far worse than he thought they would be. And he said a team of scientists at Stanford uh, predicted, they've, they've studied it and they think that if uh, consumption levels were dropped down to European standards, so we as Americans reduce our consumption levels by about 30%, the world can support about a billion and a half to two billion people and that's it. That really kind of scared me because we're gonna level out at 10 to 12 billion at the rate we're going. So does your book come to a 
conclusion as to did you bring it all together and do you pick a winner? Or do you just kind of tell the story and give us the opportunity to make our own decisions? How do you feel about all this? I, That's I'm, a question I wasn't brave enough to ask. Well, um, I, guess, I guess part of it is, is the way we want to live depends on values. You know, on what you think is right and what you think is good, what you think is a good life. I obviously have my own opinions about that, but they're not any better or, you know, than anybody else's. And so I feel pretty solid ground saying, look, this is the way things are, these are what the choices are, but, you know, the internet is full of people telling you try to tell you what to do. I really don't want to add to their number. And so, you know, I envision this book, this is hokey and pretentious, I don't know, but as a, a book that maybe my daughter could read in college and say, these are the kinds of challenges that your generation is going to face. And maybe this is a toolkit for you to decide what you want to do about them. And, you know, my heart's with you. Bless you. Make the decision. Take us into the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, over here first. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm a second year middle school teacher. Um, I teach social studies and a couple weeks ago I started my unit on Latin America and my, uh, uh, when I read your uh, 1941 and 43 they really changed how I thought about the Americas and globalization and all that and the textbooks I'm working with are still very wrong I guess about a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> Um, how they categorize just in the ancient and Maya and, and everything's categorized in just old school ways. And I was thinking, if you had this textbook, if you could rewrite it, what would your Latin America unit include? Um, or how would it be themed? Basically, can you tell me what my lesson is tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what time period are you talking about? Uh, um, I guess right now we are kind of focusing on the, the older civilizations, the big ones that the kids already know, the Maya. And oh my gosh, I know 2012, that movie that came out couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. um, and they're all like, oh, can we talk about the calendar? Sure. Well, these, um, I mean, you know that textbooks are really hard to change because of the weird way that they're produced? Um, I Probably not, but I okay. know well, this there's one's this whole, still has, you know. like, crazy system for textbooks. That, that I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but my publisher does publish textbooks. Oh. One time I asked him, can we update them? And he sort of went, ha, ha, ha. And, um, <laughs> I, you know, I asked what ha, ha, ha meant. And the way he explained it to me was that uh, you get this textbook and they're very expensive to produce. And um, to get them, you know, to, to, to have them profitable, you know, in other words, that the, so that the publishers can afford to do this, they have to be um, accepted in the large states. You know, that it's, if you spend a whole lot of money producing an American history textbook and only Rhode Island takes it, you know, you're in trouble. Um, so the three big states are um, Texas, California and New York. And they each have a special state body that has to approve all the textbooks for that state. And as he explained it to me, the New York one is super liberal. Um, the uh, the um, Texas one is super conservative. Imagine and that. the California one is super crazy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, so like they have to thread the needle to get it. Right. And okay. once you get it approved, you don't want to change anything. Okay. because it's such a nightmare, and so that there's this incredible lag in, right. in, in all this. And so, actually, I have sympathy now. So I guess know. in this fantasy world, I should preface this with this crazy fantasy world where you could change a text. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> turns out to be yeah, right. like there's, there's weird institutional reasons that it's super hard. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, you know, I would just tell them that the, the, the place is, fundamentally, the place is full of people, and there are people like us. You know, they had hopes and dreams. They made art. They had wars, you know, they were, they were, they were just like everybody else. Um, and uh, they did some spectacular stuff and it's, and it's worth knowing about. And it wasn't just that the, the, the guys who had big civilizations in stone, although those are pretty interesting, but also in places like um, the Amazon, where they had all these um, networks of small scale cities all the way through it. In places like uh, the Pacific Northwest, you had, you know, as you know, incredibly beautiful um, art and, uh, and, you know, complex societies in the, in, all throughout, um, you know, the Middle West and the Southeast, there are these mountain cities, um, about 10,000 of them, we, we, we think. It was a busy, thriving place. And if they got that from, from middle school, they'd be like ahead of 99% of American middle school students. <laughs> I feel like it, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. I, I just have a few comments. Uh, 
Actually, thank you for being here. It was thank really you. wonderful listening to you. Uh, I loved your books, 1491 and 3, and I think that you're doing a great service for the sustainability movement. Um, I'm an engineer, mm -hmm. uh, so I like to boil things down sometimes to you know just the radical part. You're talking about ethics, mm -hmm. the, making the least worst decision, and what you're really talking about, the prophet and the wizard, is really strong sustainability and weak sustainability. And they talk about finite resources and you never can you know stop that and then you can innovate yourself that's weak sustainability mm -hmm. so i wish i had you in my graduate school classes on sustainability and all the other stuff i was doing because it just was it wasn't as interesting so i think you're doing a great service Thank to you. everybody because when i talk about it and that 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 way it just people just you know they don't listen they tone out <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just a couple other things uh when you're talking about nuclear power, I understand what you're saying, but a lot of scientists also talk about the existential threat of mm -hmm. catastrophe, kind of like, and, and so when they do their little graphs of, uh, you know, how much it really costs in terms of regular costs and social costs and things like that, it's usually way off the chart. Right. And so that's, that's one thing that I, I found when I was listening to you talk. No, I was uh, just trying to give their case for it. Yeah. Right. No, yeah. you know that, that that's the, their their case for it, mm -hmm. and um, that's what I was trying to include when the prophets look at it. They say, yeah. "Wait a minute, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this this is a, the the threat to the future is just you know the idea of engaging with it and you know entertaining it is nuts. It's, it's, that's what I was trying to say. Maybe ah. didn't say it very well. Okay. Thanks, so thank you for correcting me. <laughs> oh well, yeah. I understand better now. <laughs> and then and the second one is, uh, so I try to figure out well. Is weak or, or strong sustainability the path to go? And I, I guess we'll find out maybe in your book. And well, I no, I, I, you know, it's really, it seems to me we're, and both of them involve a leap into the unknown. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you, can we make enough solar power and enough storage to, uh, and, um, and to keep going? And the wizards who point out the difficulties of that, they're quite right. Um, at the same time, I mean, the prophets look at uh, the difficulties we have constructing nuclear power plants, even aside from the existential um, issues that you were talking about, they're also quite right. And so, you know, on a, on a sort of a prudential level, it's pretty easy to come up with a conclusion that we're doomed. Yeah, you know? I, actually, <laughs> I think that's been solved. Mark Jacobson, Stanford, or excuse me, yeah, Stanford professor proposed uh, wind solar. That has been now, adopted. Now, you should, um, I, I think that's a wonderful, I talk about it in the, in, the, in, the, in the book, and that's a wonderful series of papers that oh. he and Delucci, I think his name is, and the whole team produced. Um, in the last year, it's been subjected to some very severe uh, criticism, which you, you, you probably know. And it is true, a lot of the criticism is true, but nonetheless, what they're also doing is incredibly inspiring as a blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> I suspect, Charles, that you ultimately side most with Lynn Margulis and the, and the microbes. No, I don't, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, she's right about how important they are. But, uh, you know, I, I think what I try to do at the very end is to actually engage with that and say, nobody can predict the future, so maybe she's right. <laughs> but what would be the reason for thinking she's wrong and, you know, an empirical um, one for doing it other than the kind of thing that she would have ridiculed, which is, oh, you think we're special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over here. Hi, thanks for being here. <coughs> um, two questions, unrelated. The first is, um, st I have not read your book yet. It strikes me that there's a similar format to Encounters with an Archdruid and some of a similar story that mm -hmm. John McPhee was trying to get across in that book. So I was wondering if that was a touch point for you when you were writing it. <laughs> it actually is uh, a little bit of a funny story. So I was sort of muddling around, not, you know, not really realizing that I was doing the research for the book for the first like eight years I was doing the research, you know, talking to these people. and. Um, at one point, I sort of gradually realized there are these two figures. And I know a little bit this guy named Stuart Brand, um, who is uh, sort of a major figure from the, the, the 60s, and he did the whole Earth catalog and so forth. Just an amazing guy. And um, so I was telling him this, and he says, ah, the two figures, they're engineers and druids. And, um, you know, like the arch druid in, in John McPhee's book. I said, oh, that's it. The engineer and the druid. That's my book. So I go to my editor. And I say, I've got it, and I laid it out, and I said, the engineer and the druid. He says, nobody knows what a druid is. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, no, look, John McPhee and John McPhee. And he says, okay. So we go out to lunch, and he says, I'll show you. And um, we pass Barnes & Noble. This is, you know, on Broadway in New York. And uh, he walks in, and he buttonholes the clerk, and he says, I'd like to uh, see if you have a book called The uh, Engineer and the Druid. And the clerk says, what's a druid? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs>
So yes, but I, I, I can't tip my hat because I don't have, you know, I, I banned the word druid. Yeah. Um, the second question is, is there, do you think technology is getting towards an escape velocity where the, the conflict that you're pointing out is going to get overwhelmed by some sort of progress or future thing? You read these stories about these vertical plant growing gardens and Dutch yields and solar protected fields and Are you asking about drone the tractors. No, I'm just saying, do you, do you think that there's going, is science moving to an escape velocity around investment and intellectual input on solving these problems that's going to make the division a straw man? Well, what you're, actually, I think what I hear you saying is, you know, is science and technology moving in such a um, direction that we're just going to produce so much in these different ways mm -hmm. that the wizard is just going to stomp the heck out of the profits? And um, you know, I certainly say, would say the wizards think so. Um, <laughs> And the prophets, of course, their job is to say, no, you're nuts. <laughs> Fair enough, thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. Hi, um, considering the huge role that computers and technology, not on a global scale, but on a more personal scale, has in our modern life, I'm wondering what you think, sort of the role of computers, and or even just down to smartphones and the internet, have in, in sort of your wizard and profit worldview? Well, this, I'm going to use your question as a chance to say something I forgot to say. <laughs> Is that okay? Oh, please. Yeah, okay. Um, it's important to understand that the profits are not against technology. You know, um, one of the things I did is to visit the sort of anti-wizard farm, which is uh, this amazing farm in Marengo, Illinois, run by a guy named Lloyd um, Nichols, who is growing a thousand different vari varieties of crops. It's unbelievably complicated what he is, is doing there. And what he's essentially doing is creating a, a system that's almost as complex as a natural ecosystem, but is a farm and it's super productive. Um, but the task of keeping track of all the things that he's doing is enormous and it simply wouldn't be possible without computers. And now he's using drones to uh, be able to survey the crops, you know, so that he can get some stuff. So these, these are, highly technological um, you know, he's a quote unquote organic farmer, but you know, these people are embracing technology. It's just not the kind of, same kind of technology as the, as the wizards. And so I would argue that the, the role is very large. Similarly, the people who want network solar power, the idea is that you, you, know, you have a cloud here and so you're not getting um, any sun, but your neighbor, you know, it's sunny. And so the, it shunts power over this way and it flows around here and what directs that is of course, you know, computers, something like a microgrid, you know, as they, as they call it, is just simply not possible without information technology. So this is not a, you know, sort of a thing, you're a Luddite, you know, and that, that sort of stuff. So the answer is everything, you know, it, these things have everything to do with it. And I guess kind of to dovetail onto that, the, um, this isn't a question about Bitcoin, but I'm using it as an example. Um, people have used Bitcoin as an example of, the ways that technology can help us escape from certain constraints of political systems or social systems, et cetera, et cetera. But people are starting to point out that the enormous um, power drain, the enormous power cost for running things like the internet and running things like your smartphone, even though it's mobile, it of course draws on a power grid. Um, I'm wondering if that, um, just kind of what you think of that, and even as the prophets are using technology to to further their their goals, how that might be in conflict. Well, just you know, technology is never a perfect win, right? There's always going to be a downside. There's a, the science fiction writer Bruce Sterling had a nice way of putting it. He said, uh, "There is no permanent victory condition for humanity," and um, so you know everything we solve leads to another issue that we didn't expect. And that's what it is to be human. And so um, the Bitcoin thing, I think it's actually quite funny. The idea, that they're basically saying that these, you could have these um, things, they're free, right? It's just what the market says. And of course, it turns out there is a cost um, and maybe quite a high one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. I think we have time for the last sure. two questions that are standing up, sir, over here. Awesome, thanks for being here. Sure. Um, so this is kind of a funny question. Um, I'm curious if there is some 
possible utopian future out there where we get everything figured out. I'm sure Lynn Margulis would be laughing at this. Right, hooting with laughter. You'd hear her eyes rolling <laughs> around as she was there. But, you know, there's, I'm sure, multiple possible futures out there. And say there's a utopian one where we get it all right. We, we figure out the climate change thermostat and we just lock it in and we kind of make this relatively unnatural, like climate stability for just thousands of years. Like, what do you think that would look like? And do you think it's at all possible? Like, just... just so, um, I don't know what it would look like. Um, I mean, that's really something that people will discover in the doing, right? Um, but, but I do think it's possible. And, and so here would be the argument for optimism. Here is, this is great, because this gives me a chance to say why I think Lynn Margulis is wrong, even though she's way smarter than me. Um, <laughs> And she's a National Medal, you know, Presidential Medal of Science winner, and I'm not. And, you, know, um, you know, are we special? I mean, to, because basically, your answer, your question is, you know, can we escape the walls of the petri dish? Are we special? And um, so, what would the evidence of that? And you know, we can all say, well, we feel special, but that's not actually very good evidence. And uh, <laughs> Lynn would have trashed that right off the bat. Oh, great! You know, <laughs> the dodo, I'm sure, felt he, it was special. Um, <laughs> So, um, so if you think about it, though, let's go back to the world of 1800, which looks quite different than, than our world, you know, the political map, but it's also profoundly different on a, on a social level. Um, you know, in the world of 1800, slavery is universal. There's, probably, uh, there's, um, there's either no or almost no society anywhere in the world that doesn't have slavery. The historian Adam Huckshield has estimated at that time two out of every three people on the planet were enslaved in one way or another. Um, it's a foundational, and this isn't a recent aberration, this is the human condition and has been as long as we have records. I mean, the Code of Hammurabi is the oldest legal um, code that uh, I think that, the, that we have known, and it's all about slavery. It's all about how you can buy and sell people and what you can do to the people you buy and sell. Um, it's a basic human institution. And then, in a few decades in the 19th century, it was gone. It's legal nowhere on the planet. Um, something that's utterly basic to human society. It's a huge transformation. Similarly, in the 20th century, um, you know, you, you talk to archaeologists and anthropologists, they'll tell you that every society that we actually know about in the past is based on the subjugation of women by men. Um, you know, in 1800, women can't own property anywhere in the world. Um, so far as I know, they can't vote, they can't initiate divorce, they can't do anything. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're chattel or close to it. Um, and then, you know, in the 20th century, there's a huge change. Obviously, there's much more to go, but the situation is dramatically different. And that, too, is a foundational human institution. The subjugation of women by men is, is, is you know, in terms of history, it's, it's like the law of gravity. You know, it's, you know, it's just always the case. Um, and in our own lifetimes, you know, there's been dramatic changes in the status of gay men and women. It's just incredible uh, change. So it's clear that humankind can do these enormous changes in what it does. So we obviously have the tools to do this. And just think how disappointing it would be that we got rid of slavery. You know, we did a halfway decent job with, um, with, with um, empowering women. We started to do the work on, on gay people. And then we screw up climate change. I mean, what a drag. <laughs> <laughs> So that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Thanks. I mean, how can we blow it? And that's <laughs> blowing it in the ninth <laughs> inning, right? <laughs> totally. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, maybe I shouldn't say that to a room full of Seahawks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> you shouldn't say that. Um, but we do have time for one last question. So, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a comment about your um, explanation for global warming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Steve Warren. I'm a professor of atmospheric science. Mm -hmm. Um, your um, statement that climate change is real, that's correct, and that human production of carbon dioxide is responsible, that's mm -hmm. correct. I'm not happy with what you said about the role of water vapor. The water vapor is indeed a strong greenhouse gas, mm -hmm. but the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is dependent on the carbon dioxide because water vapor is condensable. It, t it mm -hmm. totally depends on temperature. If the temperature gets too low, the water vapor mm -hmm. condenses out, Water as liquid or ice, and it's no longer there right. to be There's a greenhouse gas. So, mm -hmm. um, and indeed, if the if the carbon dioxide is too low, the water vapor comes out, and the oceans freeze, as indeed happened 700 million years ago. So, our climate is totally dependent on having enough carbon dioxide 
the natural amount of carbon dioxide, and what humans are doing is adding to it by mm -hmm. putting too much carbon dioxide. Right, we're adding too many little pieces of chicken, um, um, chewing gum in instead of the normal number. So I should change the simile that way? <laughs> I didn't hear that. What? I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. Oh, I just said, what I said is that um, carbon dioxide absorbs the wavelengths that water vapor lets through. You know, it sits right there in it. And so the simile That's I made true. is... That's true, but without carbon dioxide, the water vapor wouldn't be there either. Right, but what I'm trying to do is explain it in the simplest uh, terms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thus the discourse of science yeah. rolls on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together one more time for Charles yeah. C. Mann. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, fantastic book. As I said at the beginning, as I said at the beginning, um, you can pick up a copy of The Wizard and the Prophet at the University Bookstore table in the lobby, and Charles will be out there signing in just a minute. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.